Hallelujah. All right, so we're continuing on with our book of Enoch. And uh, we left off with chapter 21. Today, we're going to be picking it up with chapter 22. Now, as always, we're going to uh, seek to align it with our canon, you know, and, you know, the canon that we know and love, you know, and, uh, you know, as we do so, you know, I pray that some, that folks, you know, those, some of the skeptics, you know, will see that there's, you know, nothing that's scary or horrendous, you know, horrendously, you know, uh, in opposition to our canon, you know, within these uh, these other writings, you know, and especially since, you know, now that the Dead Sea Scrolls have been discovered and thereby proved what the priests were looking at, what they were, what they held sacred, you know, so, you know, now we know that the Book of Enoch was held sacred, you know, by the, uh, the ancient priests of, of the temple, the Zadokites, amen, you know, so, as we look and see, you know, how it compares to our canon, let us also learn from it, you know, because uh, everything that's in there isn't in our canon. And so some of the information is new, but that is our opportunity to learn. And there's an abundance, an abundance of, uh, of information that does align with our canon, you know? And so, you know, this is what I like to pull out and show, you know, but also the lessons that's there as well. Amen? Hallelujah. You know, so let's jump into chapter 22. Let me have my first reader read Enoch 22, one through five, please. And then I went to another place and he showed me that the West, showed me in the West, another great and high mountain and a hard rock and there were four hollow places in it, deep and very, very smooth. Three of them were dark and one bright, and there was a fountain of water in the midst. I said, how smooth are these hollow places, and deep and dark to view? Then Raphael answered, one of the holy angels who was with me and said unto me, these hollow places have, have been created for this, very, for this very purpose, and the spirits of the souls of the dead should assemble therein. Ye that all the souls of the children of men should assemble here. And these places have been made to receive them to this day of their judgment and to the period appointed. To the great judgment comes upon them. And I saw the spirit of a, of a dead man making soup. And with his voice went forth to the heaven and made soup. Hallelujah. Okay, so hereby Enoch is teaching us that there are four hollow places within the earth that are designated for the dead of humanity. Now our canon does, does not plainly tell us this, yet it does lend support for such a concept as you will see. You know, but I just want you to consider that for a minute, you know, um, because there's four places in which the dead dwell in the earth. You know, take note that they're not in heaven. Say mm -hmm. life. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, Enoch 22, 6 and 7. My next reader, please. And I asked of Raphael, the angel who was with me, and I said unto him, The spirit of which it maketh suit, who is it? Whose voice goeth forth and maketh suit to heaven? And he answered me, saying, this is the spirit which went forth from Abel, whom his brother Cain slew. And he makes his suit against him till his seed is destroyed from the face of the earth, and his seed is annihilated from amongst the seed of men. Hallelujah. Okay. You know, so here it is. You know, this is the abode of the dead. And so while there, Enoch sees, you know, the spirit which went forth from Abel, you know, and he's making soup. Now you gotta remember, Enoch is like the seventh from Adam. So this wasn't all that much, uh, you know, after, you know, the incident happened, you know, um, I'm sure it was a length of time, but 
you know, as far as, you know, how much time done tra transpired since then, it was a drop in the bucket, I mean, you know, uh, you know, so, so let's start by supporting whether or not, uh, or that should be whether or not, our canon agree that the dead can cry out to Yah, you know, so we're talking about, you know, the dead who's supposed to be at rest, you know, crying out. That don't sound like they resting to me, right? Yeah. You know, so it says, uh, let's consider Genesis 4, 9 and 10. It says, and Yahuwah said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, never let I would die. That's my way out. Uh, you know, and he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So hereby we see that our canon not only, you know, uh, supports it, it has the exact same, same thing in it. You know, it has an account of Abel crying from the dead. Amen. You know, and also consider Hebrews 11, 4 says, by faith, Abel offered unto Elohim a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Elohim testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speak. So everybody, we see our canon absolutely supports, you know, that the dead can, can, uh, can cry out to Yah. But is it just Abel? Uh -uh. Let me have my next reader read Revelation 6, 9 through 11, please. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain from the world of, of Elohim, word of Elohim, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Adonai, holy and true, doest thou not judge and average and avenge our, our blood on them that dwell on the earth and white robes were given unto every one one of them and it and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled all right okay we see that our canon does agree that the dead can do and will cry out to yah additionally you know it agrees that they cry out to um him for vengeance they're crying out for vengeance can you see that you know uh so you know before we knew that Abel had cried out, but Enoch teaches us what he was crying out about, even for vengeance, you know? So, so yeah, so we, we, we learned that, you know? Uh, also, let us consider Enoch 22, eight and nine. My next reader, please. Then I asked regarding all the hollow places, why is one separated from the other? And he answered me saying, these three have been made for the spirits of the dead might be separated. And this division has been made for the spirits of the righteous in which there is a bright spring of water. All right. So it says uh, that the three dark ones was made for the spirits of the dead, you know, uh, that they might be separated. And there's a division, you know, from them, you know, uh, that was made for the spirits of the righteous, which there is bright, where there is the bright spring uh, of water. You know, and so next let us consider whether or not our can of supports the notion that the righteous will be separated from the sinners in the afterlife. You know, fair question, you know. Um, Yahshua actually gives us a parable that speaks beautifully to this. Let me have my next reader read Luke 16, 22 through 26, please. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's 
bosom, the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham all afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send me send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Hallelujah. You know, so we see here, that Yahshua is, is pretty much saying the same thing. You know, uh, take note that where Lazarus was, there was water. But where the rich man was, there wasn't. You know, hence he was asking, can Lazarus dip his finger in the water and come bring me something? You know, also take note that the great gulf that was fixed, you know, speak to the division that Enoch spoke, spoke of. You know, and so, you know, Abraham was, was explaining like, you know, hey, you know, besides all this, you know, besides you, you in the wrong place, besides you being in the wrong place, the place of torment because you didn't do right, you know, and Lazarus being in, you know, in the right place where he's comforted, you know, now I want you to consider that, you know, Lazarus is where he is, is bright. How do we know it's bright? Because the guy that's in that's in uh he double hockey sticks he can see him amen you know he's in a dark place you know but he can he can see lazarus because lazarus is in a bright place you know and there's a goal fixed betwixt them and one can't go um to to the other side you know so um neither can they pass um from from one to the other and so what I want you to see is that one is in darkness and the other one is in light, you know, and where he's at, where there's light, there's also water. Is this not what Enoch describes? Yeah. You know, so uh, our canon absolutely supports this concept. All right, now consider Matthew Yahoo 12, 43 through 45. It says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of the out of a man he walketh through dry places seeking rest and find him none then he saith, i will return into my house from whence i came out and when he has come he findeth it empty swept and garnished then he go up and he take up um, with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter in and dwell there and the last state of the man is worse than the first even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation now, this may come up again. I wasn't sure if I had included it, but um, you know, I know it was in the original, and actually, Brother John's testimony reminded me of it, so mm -hmm. I threw it in there. So if we see it again, then you know why. <coughs> All right, you know. Um, now, take note that when the unclean spirit is going out of the man, he walketh in dry places. Remember the place that Enoch described. The place where the unclean spirits were was dry. <coughs> Hence, they didn't have any water. And they were wanting to, you know, have someone, you know, dip their finger in um, water, just bring me just a little bit, you know. They were in dry places, you know. And so I thought that was very revelatory in considering what Yahshua said here, you know, that when a spirit is gone out of a man, he go and wander in dry places seeking rest and find of none you know and then it says in verse 45 he go and take up um himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself you know and so i it's always left me bewildered i'm like where are you going to get these other spirits they just you know out chilling anywhere you know they just on every corner you know you're just going and recruiting you know 
he's going back from whence he came in those dry places, those dark, dry places, which are full of spirits, full of unclean spirits, you know, that's in, that's in torment that won't, that won't out. And it says he go and, and take us with himself seven other more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. You know, that's something to consider. You know, but I wanted to point out that, hey, this helps clarify this passage. You know, now we know where some dry places are, where spirits are kept, you know? And so it makes, <clears throat> makes a lot more sense, you know, as to where he got the spirits and where he was going, what it meant by him going through dry places, you know? And for those with eyes to see, y'all painted a picture of this concept during the time of Moshe as well. This concept of, you know, um, you know, God's people being in the place of, of light with, um, you know, uh, having, having a spring, having water and just places of darkness for the unclean. You know, when we consider Exodus 10, 22 and 23, it says, and Moses stretched forth his hand from heaven and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Mizraim three days. And they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light as well. Now I want you to think about what Enoch said about the um, the abode of the dead and how there was three places just full of darkness, but one place that had light. And I want you to imagine looking down upon Mitzrayim from on high. What would you see? A very dark place, and in the midst of it, a place filled with light. Amen. Amen. Can you see that? Yep. Y'all was um, painting this this the picture of this concept even during the time of Moshe, which they would was probably more familiar with it than we are, you know. And so they probably would have related to um, y'all showing the Miss Miss Raim um, that they were in a type of Hades versus them being in in a, uh, in, a in a type of uh place for the righteous amen all right uh that's it when i read this y'all asked me why do the righteous get to dwell in, in the bright place with the spring of water now his question in turn caused me to contemplate this question which led me to the following answer even because the righteous currently live as bright lights with a spring of water within them. Consider the following. Psalms 37, 6 says, And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as light and thy judgment as the noonday. So hereby we learn that righteousness is a type of light. Amen? You know, and so this is why the righteous will go to live in a place filled with light and with water because they're already living in a place with light. They're already light themselves. You know, um, consider Yeshayahu 58a. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning and thine health shall spring forth speedily and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of Yahuwah shall be thy re reward. You know, so again, showing that you know, light is likened unto righteousness. You know, and those of us who choose to live righteously today, we're living in light. We become light. So if we die as light, where do you think we're going to go? To a place of light. Amen? You know, also consider 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? Again, light is being uh, likened unto righteousness. And unrighteousness, darkness. So when you when you consider what Enoch said about this abode of the dead, these three places 
will that's built with um smooth and deep um places that's filled with darkness you know that they're filled with the unrighteous there and the one with light is filled with the righteous you know and please understand that this is exactly what y'all wanted for his son israel you know that is the israel of old i.e natural israel which was made up of the sons of Yaakov and the others um, and the others that made up the uh, mixed multitude. He wanted them to live with light or righteousness residing within them and emanating from them. You know, Exodus 4.22, you know, um, teaches us that Israel was truly Yah's firstborn. It says, and thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus saith Yahuwah, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Amen. Now, it's important to note that Israel was a many member body. Now, with that in mind, consider what Yah asked of Israel. In Exodus 25, 31, he says, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Mm -hmm. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knobs, and his flowers shall be of the same. You know, so here it is. Yah commands Israel to make a candlestick of pure gold. And they were to put that candlestick within their midst, even which uh, in their midst in the in the tabernacle of Elohim, you know, which was literally in the midst of Israel. Amen. You know, now consider Leviticus 24, 2. It says, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, uh, pure olive oil, beaten for the light, and cause the lamps to burn continually. The, the the candlestick, the menorah, was never to go out. Mm -hmm. So can't you see that this is just a picture mm -hmm. of Yah's son or son of Elohim walking around with light within them mm -hmm. continually, mm -hmm. never letting the light go out. Put it another way, Pastor Obadiah. Okay, if you if you if you must have it another way. It's a picture of Israel walking around in righteousness, Amen. never letting the righteousness go out. Amen. Can you see that? You know, now throughout all their travels in the wilderness, as well as the promised land, Israel were to ever have light or righteousness within and emanating out. And this is the same thing, you know, that he acts of all his children say lie but they failed to do so in ezra second ezra 10 21 and 22 we read for thou seest that our sanctuary is laid waste our altar broken down our temple destroyed our psaltery is laid on the ground our song is put to silence our rejoicing is at an end the light of our candlestick is put out the ark of our covenant is spoiled our holy things are defiled and in and the name that is called upon us is almost profaned. Our children are put to shame. Our priests are burnt. Our Levites are gone into captivity. Our virgins are defiled. Our wives ravished. Our righteous men carried away. Our little ones destroyed. Our young men are brought in bondage. And our strong men are become. That's what happens. When you let the light go out that's what happens when righteousness no longer resides within your midst now from the righteous that were carried off would emerge a second son of elohim even yahushua hamashiach who like unto israel of old also had a many member body he is not only likened unto Israel, he is Israel, and he's a direct descendant of King David, thereby making him not only an Israelite, but the king of all Israelites. Even as King David was the king of all Israelites. But this is where the likeness to natural Israel ends. For unlike natural Israel, he also became a spiritual being and gave all Israelites the opportunity to do likewise. Unlike natural Israel, which died, spiritual Israel is promised an eternal spiritual life within a spiritual promised land, even New Jerusalem. 
understanding that Yah changes not. We know he wants the same for his son, Yahushua, that he did for his son, Israel. Of all. Hence, we read in Yochanan 8, 12, it says, Then spake Yahushua again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Yahshua was that light, that light of every man that cometh into the world. Yochanan 12, 36, while ye have light, believe in the light that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Yahushua and departed and did hide himself from them. Now, did you catch that? Mm -hmm. He did hide himself from them. If he hid himself from them, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then what you think he's doing today? But everybody think they got it. Everybody think they done found it. I'm telling you, a lot of people done been hoodwinked, bamboozled, led astray. While ye have light, believe in the light that ye may be children of the light. We are blessed. We are fortunate to have the word at our disposal. And many of us don't take advantage of it. And even those of us who do have it and try to take advantage of it, Yahshua is hidden in plain sight. Say lie. Consider Ephesians 5, 8 through 11, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 and 5, and Matthew Yahoo 5, 14 and 16, my next reader, please. Ephesians 5, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Adonai, walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Ruach is in all goodness and righteousness and the truth, providing what is accessible unto the Adonai, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do, do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light shine so bright before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Hallelujah. Okay, so we all were in, in sometimes darkness, but now in Yahshua we're supposed to be light. We're supposed to walk as children of light. You know, proving what is acceptable unto the Adonai. Now take note that we're to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You know, but rather reprove them. If you see a brother or a sister doing something wrong, you're supposed to reprove them. To reprove means to admonish. It means to call their attention to it. It means to give them a warning. Let them know. You know what you're doing is wrong, right? That's what we're supposed to do. This is why we're baptized into a community of belief. If you just hanging around with the unrighteous, ain't not none of them going to remind you that you're doing wrong because they all doing wrong themselves. Darkness can't see in the dark. So if you're doing darkness in the midst of darkness, it's going to go unforetold it's going to go unnoticed but if you in the light 
and you doing darkness, somebody in the light ought to tell you. Amen? Amen. So if you see one of your brothers or sisters or even your pastor doing wrong in error, say something. We prove it. At least give them an opportunity to get, to get right. Don't assume they know. You know, sometimes you know, folks just assume like, yeah, they know better. You know, I ain't. Well, I'm gonna say something for they already know. And sometimes that's true, but sometimes that's not. So we prove them. You know, now we're not supposed to be in darkness. We're supposed to be the children of the light, children of the day. We're supposed to be the light of the world. If we're not the light of the world, then where is the light going to come from? The whole world is just going to be in darkness. Amen? And those of us who do have light, you can't put the light under a candle. And that's what one of the testimonies was about. You know, the gentleman going to try to help someone that was trying to commit suicide, trying to talk him out of it and succeeded. Well, if he took that light and put it under the candle, that, that's, that guy that was about to commit suicide may have done it. No guarantee that he would have, but there's no guarantee that he wouldn't have. Amen? You know, if we gonna be the light, then we can't be acting like the dark. It should be a stark, a stark difference, you know, a very huge contrast. Because light don't look like dark to me. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. You supposed to have some good works, you know, and people are always real quick to throw up, you know, we're not saved by your works. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about righteousness. You know, we're talking about righteousness. Righteousness at the end of the day, what you're going to be judged on. You're not going to be judged, you know, uh, on what you believe and what you confess. You're going to be judged on what you did. <laughs> He's going to judge us by our works. That's what we're going to be judged by. So let us learn a lesson from our forefathers, i.e. Israel of old, and succeed where they failed. That we might, that we might um, live our life in the afterlife within that bright place Enoch was shown, even where Lazarus was. But what are the spring of water within his midst? You know, what, what, is, what is this about? What does this speak to? This is found in Yochanan 7, 37 through 39. It says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Yahushua stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of Ruach, which they that believe on him should receive. For Ruach Kadesh was not yet given because that Yahushua was not yet glorified. So I pray that all can see that the only way one will reside within that bright place with the spring of water in its midst is if they died while being bright, i.e. righteous, with living water within their midst. That is, with the Ruach HaKodesh within their midst. This is our call. And if we answer that call and succeed, then we know we're going to where the light is and where the water is. We know we're not going to be in the dark places where it's dry. Amen? Amen. But what are the sinners? What can they look forward to in the afterlife? Well, Enoch speaks to that too. Enoch 22, 10 through 12. And this has been made for the sinners. Well, let me have my next reader read Enoch 22, 10 through 12. So I'm losing my voice. And this has been made for the sinners. When they die and are buried in the earth, the judgment has not been executed upon them in their lifetime. Here their spirits shall be set apart in this great pain till the great day of judgment, scorchings and torments of the accursed forever, so that their many 
be retribution for their spirits. There he shall bind them forever. And this division has been made for the spirits of those who make the make the suit, who make disclosures concerning the destruction when they were slain in the days of the sinners. Hallelujah. You know, uh, verse 13 goes on to say, such has been made for the spirits of men who shall not be righteous, but sinners who were complete in transgression and of the transgressors, they shall be companions, but their spirits shall not be slain in the day of judgment, nor shall they be raised from this. So hereby we learn that one of the dark places is for those who didn't receive any judgment during their lifetime above the earth, you know, or upon the earth. It's, it's a place of eternal torment and great pain as retribution for what they did upon the earth. You know, like I always say, no one gets away with anything. People may look like they're getting away with something. No one gets away with anything. Nobody getting away with anything. You know, you, you want to go through some stuff while you're here. If you did wrong, you want to go through some stuff. You don't want to be in that place. The second place of darkness spoke to a place where spirits cry unto Yah for vengeance concerning the murderers, the murderers that fell that they fell victim to whilst living upon the earth. And lastly, there was a place of darkness that whose wicked spirits, um, of those wicked spirits who refuse to be righteous, who who won't who won't be killed in the day of judgment. Whereas the text doesn't speak of the great pain and torment it doesn't say nothing about them being in great pain or, or, or torment, you know, but it does say that they're ever to remain in that dry, dark place of transgression. You know, it's a place of transgression where they transgress and where the transgressors are and they said they shall be companions, you know, and they're to be bound there, you know, from then on. As it says, nor shall they be raised from thence. You know, Enoch 22, 14 says, Then I blessed the Adonai of glory and said, Blessed be Yahuwah, the Adonai of righteousness, who ruleth forever. Hallelujah. You know, so, warn, do not enter. Ye be warned. Don't go into the dark places Enoch spoke about. Don't die in unrighteousness and have to go to the place where the unrighteous dead are that's smooth dry and dark you've been warned don't go there you know and just as an encouragement you know psalms 37 1 through 9 fret not thyself because of evil doers neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity a lot of times we look and we see what the unrighteous are doing and how they seem to get away with everything and, and how, you know, everything seemed to go their, their way. You know, this is what is being spoken of here. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green earth. Trust in Yahuwah and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be faithful. Delight thyself in Yahuwah, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. We standing on this word even now, aren't we? Commit thy way unto Yahuwah. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. If you become light in the here and now, you will be light in the hereafter. Rest in Yahuwah and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait on Yahuwah, they shall inherit the earth. And then I want to share uh, wisdom 5, 1 through 8. Says, then shall the righteous man stand in great boldness before the face of such as have afflicted. That's powerful, right there. 
Then shall the righteous man stand in boldness before the face of such as afflicted him and make no account of his labor. Remember Lazarus in the rich man? Mm -hmm. Wasn't he in his face? Yeah. It says, when they see it, they shall be troubled with terrible fear. And shall be amazed at the strangeness of his salvation. So far beyond all that they look for. Did you catch that? The ones who make it, the ones who get it right, their salvation is going to look strange to others. Why? Because it's the straight gate that they made it through that's hard to find. It's the straight gate and the travel, the, um, the, the uh, straight and narrow way that they travel that few be their own. You know, everybody else is, has went through the wide gate and are traveling the broad way that lead up unto destruction. Amen? You know, so, yeah, it's going to seem, they're going to be amazed at the strangeness of your salvation. So far beyond all that they looked for. They didn't look for it to be that way. Verse 3, and they repenting and groaning for anguish of spirit shall say within themselves, this is he whom we have sometimes in derision and a proverb of reproach. We fools accounted his life madness and his end to be without honor. Y'all lucky I'm not a preacher because this is a preacher. You know, <laughs> you know, a lot of folks' lives not strange enough. They salvation just not strange enough. You know, Yahshua said he came not to bring peace, but a sword. Amen. A sword divides, it cuts. You know. Who's been cut out of your life for your salvation? Have you lost a mother? Have you had to cut your mom off, your father, sister, your brother, a child, a spouse? Because Yahshua said, if you love any of them more than him, you're not worried. I'm here to tell you that this salvation that scripture teaches is strange. It's strange. It looks strange to the average eye because the average eye can't see in the spiritual realm. You have to understand that. And if your salvation isn't strange to the average eye, then you need to question your salvation. Mm -hmm. yeah. If your salvation hasn't caused you to cut some folks off or cut some things out of your life, if you're not looking mad, that is crazy. If your life don't look crazy, if you don't look like a crazy fool, then you're doing something wrong. This Wisdom 5 4 says, We fools. Accounting his life madness. You should look crazy to the average person. Verse 5. How is he numbered among the children of Elohim and his lot among the saints? I don't know what Bible some people read. <laughs> but when I read about the saints, they all look mad to me. They all look crazy. Yeah, folks walking around naked for years. Yeah, folks laying on their side for months. Yeah, folks going through high water and all kinds of trouble. Going against the grain in every way. Being, being reproached by all of their peers, all of their family, by even their whole nation. Mm -hmm. 
going without food for weeks on end. Willingly getting beat and rejoicing about it? Absolutely. Go away with, with a smile on their face afterwards? <laughs> don't tell me that these people don't sound crazy. I'm here to tell you if your salvation is not strange to the average person, something you're doing wrong. Because I'm here to tell you that this Christianity that they that they push in the day is like dope, Tito. All it's going to do is get you high. All right. It's not going to save you. Mm. Yeah, it's going it's going to get you it's going to get you high. It's going to take you on this spiritual this emotional roller coaster filled with highs, lows, and twists. But in the end, it's going to lead to one of these dark places that Enoch was talking about. Because the way of Yahuwah is strange. It causes the follower to look mad, to look crazy. And most people just trying to fit in. You can't fit in if you yachts. Mm. Folks don't get it. Verse 6. Therefore have we erred from the way of truth. And the light of righteousness have not shined unto us. The sun of righteousness rose not upon us. We wearied ourselves in the way of wickedness and destruction. Yea, we have gone through deserts where there lay no way. But as for the way of Yahuwah, we have not known it. Most people not on that straight way that lead up unto life, that straight and narrow way that lead up unto life. They're just not there. You know, most folks, they try to fit in. They want, they want to have Yah in their life, and they want to have, you know, the world in their life. You have to choose. You have to choose. Verse 8. What have pride profited us? Or what good have riches with our vaunting brought us? A lot of people are prideful because they got this, that, and the other thing. You know, and they, they feel like they their riches, you know, can you know can get them out of any situation or you know, save them, you know, from from the world and in some cases it can but it can't save you from Yah Amen. that's what it can't do so you've been warned that's all I have for you prayer was a blessing